Uh, many of you know about the now annual summer forum we have in Aspen regarding Homeland Security and counterterrorism. Many of you were there for it this past July, and I hope that all of you will come to Aspen next summer for the Security Forum in 2012, the dates we have already, July 25th to 28th. Secondly, of course, the purpose of today's discussion is to launch a new group, the Aspen Homeland Security Group. Uh, I want to thank the sponsors of the Aspen Homeland Security Group, the Lockheed Martin Foundation and IBM. And to moderate today's discussion with our featured guests, we're very fortunate to have the noted Washington Post foreign affairs, national security columnist, David Ignatius. And I should also mention, as I'm sure all of us know, that David is also uh, an acclaimed and best-selling novelist. <coughs> His newest novel, Blood Money, will be the subject of a discussion here at the Aspen Institute on September 28, led by Walter Isaacson. With that, David, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Clark, for the introduction, and especially for the book plug. Uh, we authors appreciate that. Uh, as Clark said, this is the launch session for a new group, the Aspen Highland Security uh, Group. Uh, and it's an attempt, um, as explained to me by the people who put it together, to do for Homeland Security what is so obviously a part of our uh, culture here in Washington with foreign policy and other major policy issues. That is to provide a forum where people in and out of government can get together and talk, uh, think about problems, uh, make some progress in them. It's interesting that in the area of Homeland Security, you don't have the infrastructure uh, of think tanks, of academic groups that uh, makes possible that discussion. And so um, this is uh, the, the basic idea behind, behind the group. So let me introduce now the members on the, on the podium. <laughs> Jay, that was a great entrance. <laughs> Really that was super, superb. Um, uh, on my immediate right, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, and then the two uh, co-chairs of this new Aspen uh, Homeland Security Group, uh, Jane Harmon, former uh, representative uh, from California, um, composed We're even really after dead. rushing from Nearly goodness dead. knows where. Um, uh, and uh, now, um, after, after a, a remarkable career in Congress, uh, where she was a, really a leader in bipartisan efforts on Homeland Security and, and intelligence, uh, head of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, and to her right, uh, the, the previous Secretary of Homeland Security, known to all of you, I'm sure Michael Chertoff, uh, now head of the Chertoff Group, which does consulting in this area. So with that uh, in brief introduction of the people on the podium, I, I want to ask the other members of this newly f formed group uh, who've come today if they would be willing to stand. I'm just going to quickly read their names, but I just would like the audience to have a sense of who's going to be taking part in these discussions. Uh, Richard Benvenisti, Bill Bratton, Michael Chertoff, uh, already up here, PJ Crowley, Clark Irvin, who you saw before, Jane here on the podium, Michael Hayden, uh, Brian Jenkins, Michael Leiter, Jim Loy, Gene Meserve, Paul McHale, Dan Prieto, Suzanne Spaulding, and Evan Wolf. And I should note that also in the audience today is the head of the TSA, John Pistol. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful group <laughs> gathered. Um, let, let's give every let's give the organization its members uh, a hand. And and now to. <coughs> Uh, questions. Madam Secretary, we have just uh, passed this very s solemn and meaningful anniversary uh, and, and thought deeply about, about, the, about our past, our recent past. Um, but, but now, in, in the week after that anniversary, it's the right time to be looking forward. And so I'd like to ask you uh, to, to help us think about the, the threat to the homeland as you and your colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security now conceive it. And if you could talk about, about, about what's new in that picture, what's changing in that picture, uh, I know we'd all be grateful. Well, thank you, David. And, and let me uh, thank our, our co-chairs as well um, for their efforts and, and their service and, and the members of, of the committee. Uh, actually, it's a great question because one of the reasons um, this group has formed is because in the Homeland Security area, uh, we need to be looking forward. It's a, it, we, we live in an ever-changing environment where threats are concerned. Uh, the Homeland Security enterprise uh, is also changing very rapidly, not only in the United States but around the world. 
Uh, and we need to be thinking proactively and, and getting help from others outside the department to help us think proactively about threats and, and what Homeland Security really <coughs> entails. Um, I would say that, uh, to summarize briefly, uh, that uh, <coughs> core al-Qaeda, uh, the, the source of the attacks of 9-11, has been uh, depleted, uh, and its leadership obviously killed or constrained. Uh, uh, but there are other al-Qaeda-related groups or groups inspired by their ideology uh, that continue to grow and move around the world. Uh, the group that has been the most impactful toward the United States and remains so is AQAP. Uh, they were the source of the underwear bomber, Abdul Matalab, and of course the package bomb plots uh, last year. Um, but there are other groups uh, that are similar to AQAP that continue to target the West and uh, target the United States. Uh, in addition, we have the phenomenon of the, of the U.S. persons who now have become radicalized to the point of violence, uh, the, the so-called homegrowns. Uh, some of them are, uh, would also fall in the subset of lone wolves or lone actors, uh, radicalized. Uh, the Internet often is a, an accelerant of that, a vehicle of that, uh, a very difficult uh, <coughs> phenomenon to deal with from a preventive <coughs> basis, and we have been devising strategies on how you deal with the growth of, of lone wolf actors uh, uh, within the United States who are actually U.S. persons. Um, so changing notions of al-Qaeda, uh, the rise of the homegrown, and then changing tactics and techniques, ever evolving, always changing, uh, <laughs> forcing us to be always thinking creatively about what the next source of threats will be and the tactics and techniques that will be used to, to carry out uh, those threats. Um, Lastly, uh, just from an institutional standpoint, David, uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, no matter how uh, well organized, well managed, whatever, cannot by itself uh, uh, provide 100 percent of all of the security of the homeland. It needs to be viewed as a shared responsibility, uh, shared with other federal agencies, with state and local law enforcement. Uh, but also with the private sector, uh, with, the, with the public writ large, with individual citizens. Um, and that is changing as well. That means communicating how that shared responsibility <coughs> is to be carried out. Uh, I, I know this audience would be interested if you could say a little bit more uh, within the limits of, of what's possible for you about the new threats that you mentioned, the, the, the increasing concern about homegrown terrorists and, and ways to, for the FBI and other agencies to have a, a good sense of what's going on there. And then secondly, this, this, this threat that uh, John Brennan uh, highlighted before the 9-11 anniversary and that's increasingly on people's minds, so hard to, to identify and protect against, namely the individual lone wolf who, who's been reading things on the internet and just without uh, a, lo a lot of signals we can observe goes out and, and acts. And, Tell us, if, if you would, how, with each of those, you're thinking about, about, about good uh, uh, protective measures. Well, I, I think uh, this, is, this is where broadening uh, the sense uh, of responsibility, sharing the responsibility, enlarging mm -hmm. the eyes and ears uh, in the right way is, is really an integral part now of our homeland security strategy. Uh, when we have a campaign such as See Something, Say Something, which uh, we're using, the FBI now is using, uh, public entities across the country are now using, uh, you see it on Amtrak, you hear my voice on the Washington, D.C. Metro in the morning when you go to work, if you take the Metro. Um, that, that is me, by the way. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, when you're talking about uh, a lone wolf or a lone actor, People have to be situationally aware, and so when a street vendor in New York sees uh, a, a truck he's not used to seeing in a location with smoke coming out of it to immediately alert the police, uh, well, that's the Times Square bomber. When a city employee who's cleaning the streets for the MLK parade in Spokane, Washington, and sees an unattended package and alerts the police, well, that was an IED that could have killed hundreds. When a gun a uh, gun dealer in Texas uh, notices a purchaser who is uh, acting oddly and strangely and, and saying very strange things 
uh, well, that prevents uh, another Fort Hood type massacre. So, uh, one of our ways of dealing with the lone wolf is uh, to really expand kind of the eyes and ears of people who are aware, watching, but in the right way. Jane Harmon, you for many years uh, were um, one of the people responsible for oversight of our intelligence agencies and, and Homeland Security. And uh, although you're now out of Congress, um, you still have some perspective uh, like that of an overseer. And I'd, I'd be interested in, in how you would evaluate the threat and also uh, what uh, Secretary Napolitano has just said about about how uh, her agency is, is preparing for it. What are the things that, that, that strike you as important for this audience? Well, first let me uh, commend Janet Napolitano <laughs> for evolving uh, the good work of Michael Chertoff and getting the Homeland Department, which I think any sane person would agree was a kind of extremely ambitious um, idea uh, to, to become more of one team and more effective at, at combating what are uh, really evolving threats. Um, I, I heard on my television last night that you and John Pistol are going to improve um, our ability to walk through those uh, machines at the airport uh, without... Uh, Children first. Yeah. <laughs> without embarrassing pictures and maybe even to keep our shoes on. So I think uh, a grateful public should acknowledge that. I also want to say, uh, David, that the the, the group that uh, Aspen and, and Clark Irvin is, has assembled for this, this uh, to, to advise the secretary and deal with these issues is the most as astonishingly, astonishingly impressive group I've ever seen. I mean, how can I be looking at Mike Hayden and Bill Bratton and others and thinking that I have something more to contribute than they do? So there, and sitting next to Mike Chertoff. Um, David and I and Mike Leiter and a few others actually address some of these topics uh, at the Wilson Center on, on, on Monday. And my, my view of the, of the threat is uh, similar to what Janet has said. However, with respect to um, the homegrown threat, uh, as uh, Mike Leiter said, um, they're really homegrown. They're not, ho they're not uh, lone wolves. They're lone puppies. Uh, <laughs> most of these uh, people are not capable of mounting serious attacks or maybe even any attacks. Nonetheless, uh, I would predict that conventional attacks are in our near-term future. That means uh, car bombs, uh, suicide vests, things of that nature. Uh, and uh, the reason that we have seen so few attempts is a vigilant public and an evolving uh, Homeland Security Agency and a much improved intelligence community capability. So uh, I think that's a good thing. Let me just focus on a couple of gaps that that are very troubling uh, outside of the Homeland Department. So this is not a criticism of our secretary. Uh, one is the continued lack of a national interoperable communications emergency network. Um, I think we should anticipate that some of these threats will happen in near simultaneous time frames around the country. And we still can't all talk to each other in real time. And that is an embarrassment. The second thing is the failure to reorganize Congress, something I can speak to. And why does that matter? Congress provides money. It also should provide uh, clear oversight. And it shouldn't waste the Secretary of Homeland Security's time reporting to 80-plus committees and subcommittees. And that is something that has not been addressed. And uh, Congress is in the 19th century. The threats are in the 21st century. So I think it's, it's uh, highly problematic. And um, I you know, for another time. But, but uh, this able group of people hopefully will solve that. <laughs> Michael. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Michael uh, Chertoff, uh, your uh, opening thoughts about the, about the nature of the threat, and I, to focus that a little bit more, I'd be particularly curious about, about what you think um, the new challenges that we haven't talked about, that we aren't really anticipating yet, but that are out there might look like? <clears throat> well, first, I, I agree with what's been said. Um, and uh, I think it's um, a tribute to the really great work that uh, Secretary Napolitano has done with DHS and, and uh, that Jane Harmon did as a member of Congress that we've really seen quite a lot of uh, maturation uh, and uh, a lot of confidence, I think, in our ability to deal with uh, the range of challenges that we have. Uh, with respect to lone wolves, I agree that's, that's an issue. I wouldn't. I wouldn't minimize that. Nadal Hassan killed over a dozen people and wounded many more. 
uh, you're going to get uneven <coughs> um, uh, capabilities. One of the things I actually think is interesting to consider is whether the death of bin Laden and the removal of a certain generation of Al Qaeda leaders actually changes the tactical picture to some extent. You know, in, in some ways, we had the benefit of, of a bin Laden who was locked into repeating another 9 11. That's where his head was at. Now you've got a generation of leaders like an Adnan Shukri Jum or an Anwar Alaki in, in Yemen who actually lived in the United States. And they understand this country much better than bin Laden did. And their appreciation of what our vulnerabilities in our culture are might actually result in a change of tactics. So we have to be, I think, mindful of that. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, two areas I, I, I worry about, I know that um, <clears throat> you know, both the Secretary and, and Congressman worry about, are cybersecurity, uh, which has uh, always been a big problem, but I think we're now seeing a lot of uh, publicity about it, which is a good thing, but it underscores the issue. And I worry about biological attacks, which uh, while we haven't had one it, from Al Qaeda, we did have one in 2001. And those who lived through that, and I did understand how challenging yeah. that is and how much worse it would be <clears throat> if someone had decided they wanted to spread that weaponized anthrax in a subway system or in a, a shopping center or something of that sort. Finally, last thing, um, I, I agree that we have a proliferation of groups. I mean, we have, in addition to the Al Qaeda franchises, we have Lashkar e Toiba in <clears throat> Pakistan, and there are other similar groups that are out there. I also worry a little bit, frankly, about the increased viciousness of transnational organized criminal groups. There was a story in the paper today about a couple of people who were tortured and hung in Mexico because apparently they had blogged against the drug cartels. So right now, tactically, what they're doing in, in parts of Mexico and Central America is identical to what we used to see in Baghdad or we've seen in Afghanistan. The only difference is that these are up to now, not, quote, ideologically motivated. They're motivated by, by ordinary criminal uh, interests. But I could see a circumstance where this becomes a more and more serious issue <clears throat> to the United States, certainly overseas, maybe even here at home, um, either because uh, uh, there's a blending between the ideological and the criminal or simply because uh, these groups continue to grow. So I think we have a series of new challenges we have to think about. Just to, to follow up on that, because it's, a, it's such a, a disturbing uh, set of events in Mexico, I, if I could ask uh, Secretary Chertoff and Secretary Napolitano, the, does the information that you see suggest that that kind of uh, extreme violence uh, of the, of the Mex Mexican uh, narco traffickers is in the process of jumping the border so that there's a homeland security component as if an insurgency outside was, was threatening to, to come within our borders, and what are you going to do about it? Well, I'll, I'll, I mean, I, during my period, I didn't see it jump across the border uh, a little bit. I mean, we did lose some agents, uh, but it wasn't in a big way. There was almost like a taboo. <clears throat> but I will tell you that there was kind of a taboo on attacking the United States until September 11th. So while... Yeah, uh, there, there are reasons to think that the cartels would think very hard before taking it across the border. Um, as we dial up enforcement on our side of the border and go after the guns and the money and things of that sort, it is not inconceivable that someone might decide that they're going to try to use those tactics against us. We built a plan when I was there about if we had to surge, what would we do in terms of additional capabilities at the border. So again, you want to prepare for the worst, even though, I, at least during my tenure, I didn't actually see a major spillage. Madam so, Secretary? Well, we, um, uh, right now we haven't seen spillover violence of, this, of, of that sort, but we are very cognizant of the cartels and what they're doing in Mexico. Actually, we're working very closely with Mexico uh, on law enforcement efforts there. Uh, the president, uh, uh, President Calderon, has I mean, that has staked his presidency really on uh, getting control over the cartels. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have uh, increased uh, boots on the ground and infrastructure and technology mm -hmm. along the border, uh, and are watching very closely to make sure we don't see any spillover violence uh, from the cartels. One thing we have to be careful about is, you know, the, the cartels are still motivated. These, these are drug cartels. 
Uh, and what we want to uh, be very careful about is that the northern states of Mexico don't become kind of uh, free zones that allow them to transit uh, right up and into our border uh, large amounts of drugs without having to worry about being interdicted. And so those northern states of Mexico are a key concern. But a couple of just things to add. As, as, as was pointed out, although the top of al-Qaeda has been degraded, uh, the nature of the threat is still, while changed, is still strong. It's now a, a series of loosely affiliated organizations. Some of them are al-Qaeda, some are others, but they're opportunistic in the way they act. And affiliating with organized crime is something they have done and can continue to do, not just uh, in Mexico, but inside our own country or with other <coughs> countries. And we have seen uh, large terror attacks in Latin America, um, Hezbollah, which is a very uh, potent non-Al-Qaeda uh, terror <coughs> group, um, uh, you know, based at mostly in Lebanon, but harbored in Syria and uh, capable of attacking Israel and other places, attacked in Buenos Aires. So my, my point about this is, um, this is not a static situation. Just going That's after right. the narco traffickers in Mexico doesn't mean necessarily yeah. that we are um, going to protect ourselves from affiliations between organized crime and terror. Because it's uh, so fresh in all of our minds, I'd like to ask each of you to comment briefly about the way in which uh, our threat response was organized uh, with the credible threat uh, of, of al-Qaeda operatives seeking to enter, entering the United States that was uh, released to the public last Thursday. What was striking to me as an observer was how quickly in what seemed a very deliberate decision, this information was dispersed very widely to law enforcement around the country. So that by Friday morning, uh, you had the Vice President of the United States on breakfast television talking about intelligence that was about 36 hours old, if I understand it. Uh, I've never seen anything quite like that. It seemed something new, and I want to ask you, Madam Secretary, and the other uh, uh, panelists uh, here, if, if that is a kind of new uh, model for how we want to deal with information that comes in and, and what to expect in that regard. Um, yeah, it is. It's, it, it actually uh, corresponded with the new National Terrorism, Terrorism Advisory System, uh, which we have deployed, and, and it's a real uh, emphasis on information sharing. And how do you get information sharing out at, at, uh, to state and local law enforcement? How do you share it among the federal family? How, do, how, do, how does the federal family... Uh, coordinate and operate. The information that went out went jointly out from DHS and the FBI. Uh, so what has evolved over uh, time and over the existence of the department uh, are those partnerships with, within the federal government and the ability to get that information out, get it out fast, with some context, uh, with some recommendations about what to do, uh, and uh, w with the ability to, to receive information back and, and to share not just information but analytics as well. Uh, Jane Harmon and Secretary Chertoff, how did how did you think that that terror alert, credible threat alert, was handled? I thought it was superb, and I uh, give a lot of credit to the NYPD and and the Washington law enforcement agencies, the Washington area law enforcement agencies, for understanding precisely what to do. There was no confusion about this. The message was consistent. I was in New York most of the weekend, and there were very serious, uh, probably 35,000 cops out there uh, checking many, many vehicles, but yet the city stayed open. Uh, people moved. There was a big parade on Fifth Avenue on Saturday, and uh, nothing happened. Uh, I do think the threat was credible, and I thought the response was incredible. I thought I was in New York, yeah, I, I was in New York too, and I thought it was very, um, uh, really well executed in terms of increased security presence, not uh, really minimal disruption. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of disruption around Times mm -hmm. Square, as you'd expect. But, um, you know, proving that actually, if you look back, there's been a tremendous amount of proven over time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let me ask about a subject that was referred to briefly. It's, it's the aspect of Homeland Security that uh, most often occasions wisecracks, comments by uh, late night television hosts, uh, and that's the activities of the of the TSA. Um, we we talked earlier. <laughs> I tried to protect you, John. I well, tried. 
John, we, 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 uh, my, my hope here is that we can preview. Um, <laughs> if you didn't see uh, the head of the Transport Security Administration just tried to move his badge to somebody else's <laughs> pocket. Um, we have coming a, a new a program that, as I understand it, it is going to focus more on the, the riskier uh, uh, people who are using our air transport system. Uh, and is going to make it easier for the so-called trusted traveler. And maybe, uh, Sec Madam Secretary, you could explain that, and I'd be interested if, if Jane and Mike could critique it. Um, there are a lot of, I mean, it's, you know, it sounds wonderful to have fewer hassles at the airport, <coughs> but um, I'm sure that there, that there are trade-offs, and we probably need to understand them and think about them in this context. Uh, well, yes. What, what we're doing is, is moving to an in, what we call intelligence and risk-based process at the airports. And the overall goal is to be able to separate passengers who are low risk from passengers for whom we have little or no knowledge or who, for a variety of reasons, we might privately denominate as higher risk. Uh, and uh, to be able to focus our, our energies there <laughs> as opposed to here. Um, to do that in a system that has 400 some odd airports and processes 1.8 million passengers a day is not the easiest thing in the world to do. You know, it's not like flipping on a switch. Uh, and so we're, we're beginning with um, some things that we have high confidence will be low, low risk, if, if any risk, of uh, danger to the traveling public. Uh, the, the first set of reforms uh, or changes will involve kids and shoes and pat downs on kids uh, and but each of the each change we make uh, requires training of the the officers in the field of which there are tens of thousands uh, it requires uh, uh, everyone every change we make requires better technology overall and we and we wait for technology to catch up with what we need uh, and, and the like, but the, 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 the guiding principle that we are driving toward is really uh, being able to quickly separate uh, passengers and for a certain category of passengers uh, to be able for them to pay a fee and basically have a pre-screen, pre-background check uh, uh, credential. Uh, global entry is the name we give that for the international travelers. Uh, we just passed our millionth uh, passenger that has signed up for that. That works very well for, for those who, who are frequent travelers. So uh, as we grow that system internationally, we look at other ways to do it, uh, to do something similar domestically. That's a ways off, um, but uh, kids and shoes, I think, is in our near future. Jane? Well, I applaud all that, and I think it should be easier for the trusted traveler to move, but we still need, and I know everyone up here agrees with me, a system that is layered and unpredictable. What do I mean by that? Layered means uh, a, a series of layers of, of protection, and we have that at our airports now. Um, they're not ones that need to be described on uh, the public airwaves, but there are many things that are going on in an airport. I know what to look for because I've been briefed on this, uh, that are protecting the traveling pu public. That's number one. Unpredictable means that we have to keep changing our procedures because we don't want the bad guys who are pretty are very nimble and evolve their tradecraft uh, to game us and <clears throat> plan around us. And in that context, I am for um, revising the treatment of kids. However, let's understand that kids are used as pawns uh, by a group of people who want to blow up as many of us as possible and are prepared to blow up their own kids. So we can't totally take kids out of the system. That's right. And for all of these changes, there will always be a certain amount of unpredictability and a random number that are still checked uh, because, because of exactly what you say. If you totally exempt a group, that very group will be exploited to be used as a, as a terrorist weapon. So uh, there will always be some unpredictability and randomness uh, in the system. I think that's a, that's a really important point. Uh, let me just begin by disclosing I'm on the board of a company that's working on registered travelers, so we we'll get that out there and over with. Um, uh, two, two, quick, two quick points, though. Um, uh, one is on the randomness thing. I, I, I don't think you can underestimate the importance of that. I mean, one of the great deterrents to terrorism is when they can't predict and they can't map out what they're going to do, so I think preserving that's important. Second, I think you need to manage expectations about 
um, what it means to be trusted and not trusted. Because down the line, uh, not being in the trusted category is going to offend some people. And uh, to the point that, that I think Jane made, I used to get asked the question I'm sure the Secretary does now about, you know, why do you do children at all? And I would use the example of these horrible cases where you have like eight-year-old kids in Afghanistan who were sent out with a bomb strapped up to, onto them to be detonated remotely. Or the fact that when we did the airline plot, in 2006, there was a couple, a young married couple that were going to get on with a baby, one-year-old baby, and blow themselves up. And so, you know, I wish I, we lived in a world where uh, kids were off limits. The other example I used to, question I used to get was, what about all these elderly people? And I would say, well, what was the age of the guy who went into the Holocaust Museum with a gun and start, started to try to kill everybody there? He was 92. So, you know, I'm, I, the demographics, the perception of what a terrorist looks like, uh, you know, Jihad Jane, Colleen LaRose, blonde hair, blue Jihad eye. I am not Jihad Jane. No, not her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but it's not, people have to understand that it's a there much more no, complicated issue. That is right. right. There, and there is no com common picture Correct. in that regard. Let me um, ask on that, on that point what you would say, um, Madam Secretary, and, and, and others on the panel would say, to Muslim Americans who, who worry that no matter what, no matter what nice words are, surround the policy, in a world where uh, Osama bin Laden and other uh, Muslim extremists issue religious proclamations calling on Muslims to commit violence that Muslims are going are to be selected out, that they will be profiled. Um, how, how do you answer that, that, that question? I know it's, it's a, a subject of deep concern for, for, for many Muslims and the answer isn't easy, but what, how would you respond? Well, uh, again, uh, when, you, when you have intelligence and risk-based systems, uh, you, you, that is a much more effective law enforcement and security tool than profiling. And profiling doesn't provide you with the information that you need. Uh, and so uh, it's, it, it's a matter of explaining what's effective, what's not effective. And, and to the extent we're profiling, we're probably missing people that we need to focus mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, a few more points. Um, not all terrorists in the United States are Muslim. Think Timothy McVeigh and others. Uh, and so that's point one. Number two, we need the support of the Muslim community in this country, 99% of which, or probably higher, is law-abiding and very patriotic uh, Americans, many of them recent immigrants, uh, in order to find uh, those few among them to the extent that some of this violence is, is, uh, is, is in the Muslim community. Uh, who are, are planning to perpetrate bad deeds. I mean, these community outreach programs that the LAPD and other uh, law enforcement agencies have matter, uh, and they save lives. So building trust with the Muslim community matters. Finally, uh, in the 2004 uh, intelligence reform law, which I had a, uh, quite a big role in, in drafting, we require the president to stand up a privacy and civil liberties board. Uh, president Bush, uh, nominated some people, but the board was never uh, very, uh, it was never robust. And President Obama has nominated two people, that's not a quorum, and there is no board functioning now. And I think that that is a, another huge gap, that if we had this board that would review our policies on the front end, number one, they'd probably be better policies, but number two, they would give more confidence to Muslim communities that we are not in any way uh, treating them uh, unfairly. We, we do, in fact, uh, we do need a board. We do, in fact, within the department, have a civil liberties component mm -hmm. that reviews mm -hmm. our policies ahead of time and does a lot of outreach into the Muslim American communities, precisely uh, for the reasons that, that Jane said. Uh, that outreach is very valuable, and it goes both ways. Mike, what, what thoughts do you have about this? This is a perennial problem, uh, a deep concern to people. Yeah, I'm, I'm, well, I, f I fully agree with what was said. I mean, it's, you know, one of the advantages we've had as a country has been that we have integrated various groups of immigrants in, and so we haven't had the kind of tension that, candidly, you've seen in some of the Western European countries where people come in and they kind of get segregated and they don't really actually become fully part of the society. That's been a real strength. I've actually been troubled and, and mildly surprised that in the last couple of years, uh, it seems to be, uh, there seems to be a, a more noise about 
uh, being anti-Muslim then was the case right after 9-11 when you would have thought that would have been the period that people would be most agitated. And I think it's really important to push back on that, uh, not only because of the law enforcement benefit you get when the community tells you, as they have repeatedly, there's a problem here, but because that's really one of the pillars of the society is to, is to avoid that sense of alienation and disaffection, which has been a problem creating lone wolves elsewhere. So I'm hoping that um, you know, we can really pay some attention to making sure we push back on this, uh, some of this hysteria that has come up recently concerning Muslims. And one, one point to add, David, is that uh, as part of our counter-narrative against this stuff, we should point out that uh, far more Muslims have been killed uh, by al-Qaeda and related groups than non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. I would just note as, as moderator the one striking thing to me about last weekend's anniversary was the lack of public anti-Muslim anger, talk of revenge. It was a, it was a good thing to see. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask about, about uh, one of the next 10 year subjects and it's one that I know you spend a lot of time on and that our other panelists have, have, have thought uh, deeply about and that's cybersecurity. Uh, and if I could uh, set up my question this way, as I understand it, the Department of Homeland Security is essentially being asked to be an interface with the public, with American uh, uh, companies, uh, with the defense industrial base, eventually with other key parts of the infrastructure bet between them and our intelligence agencies, especially our extremely a sophisticated national security agency, which is out there doing all kinds of mysterious things, uh, seeing, identifying threats before they can before they can can hurt us. And I want to ask you f first: Are you comfortable with that role? You know, the NSA is one of those sets of initials that makes people vibrate; they get nervous. And you're now being asked to to you know be its be its sort of uh, uh, interface, its 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 its, uh, its companion. In, 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 in doing key things. Are you comfortable with that? And do you think that we are moving towards some kind of general DHS-led protection for the civilian infrastructure? Is that where you'd like to see us go? So that not just a few key uh, defense contractors, but a much wider range of, of private companies had protection? Well, uh, let me answer the NSA part of the question first. When, when you <coughs> When you look at the, the cyber world from a how does government organize point of view and you read the result of the president's uh, uh, cyber review uh, process, uh, you, you realize that really 95% of, of the cyber equities that we have are either in DOD or in DHS. Um, and uh, the DHS part is the protection of the .gov space uh, but it's also the interface, as you say, David, with, with the private sector. Uh, now, the, the question presented originally was, do we have our own NSA capability? Do we actually have two NSAs, one that reports to us and one that reports to the DOD? And the answer was that that, that, that is not the best way to organize. It's, it's redundant. Um, the NSA is an enormously complex uh, uh, organization with uh, a lot of uh, cyber experts in it. I almost said cyber geeks, but uh, that <laughs> they, would be They'd be wrong. flattered, probably, they, a lot uh, of them. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but we need access to some of that technological capability at, at the DHS level. So what Secretary Gates and I negotiated was an MOU uh, by which uh, uh, we have interface and, and uh, with the NSA. Uh, we have people over there. They have people over with us. Uh, some of the people we have over there, by the way, however, are our lawyers uh, to make sure that we abide by privacy and civil liberties concerns uh, about uh, intrusion uh, into the cyber world. So we have set that up via, MO, via MOU. With respect now to uh, the private sector, they control the critical infrastructure of the country. Eighty-five percent of it is in, in their hands. Um, and so what we are working on now, and, and I will say it's in its nascent stage, is really effective interface uh, with them uh, so that we provide information to them, they provide information to us, uh, and that there is a smooth uh, communication pathway between us. 
Um, that it is nascent in part because it's been unclear until recently kind of what the roles and responsibilities are. Uh, there will be cyber legislation that moves on the Hill uh, this year that will clarify some of that. One of the issues will be whether industry will be mandated to do certain things or incentivized to do certain things. Uh, but uh, regardless, we are proceeding along the lines that uh, in the cyber world where things are happening very quickly now, uh, we need to make that exchange between the public and the, uh, and the private uh, uh, more rapid, uh, more real time, and uh, more precise. Do you have any lean at this point uh, on the key question you cited? Should this be a mandate? Everybody has to do it, or should it be a matter of incentives? It's in your interest to do it, so we'll expect you will. Uh, you know, my lean, and I think uh, I think where the legislation uh, will lean is let's start with uh, incentive with incentives. Uh, you know, you can always go to something more rigid if if you need to over time, but uh, you know, it's an I think, from my standpoint, it's in everyone's self-interest to have a robust cyber protection regime. So that's an incentive in and of itself. Uh, Jane, what, yeah. what are your thoughts? Well, this is a, you know, a, a very complicated problem. Uh, first, I never thought of Mike Hayden, who used to run NSA as a geek, but maybe <laughs> I will reassess. Uh, second, NSA is the agency in our government that actually understands the technical side of the problem. And I agree with... Uh, uh, Secretary Napolitano, that we shouldn't and can't replicate that at DHS. But what we should and can do is make DHS trusted to uh, be the interface with me and you and the private sector, particularly, to help with an understanding of this problem. It goes beyond national borders. X's and zeros don't respect national borders. And ultimately, the solution will have to be international. We can you know, protect, hopefully, we're not doing it so well yet, our defense secrets and maybe our government secrets. But in order to uh, protect the private sector and the infrastructure it controls, we're going to need an international regime. And that, um, in this economy with constrained resources and, and some <laughs> broken political institutions, is going to be a very, very big challenge. Mike, are, are you comfortable with the, the Obama administration has put a lot of time into its new cyber, cyber uh, security policy? What do you think of it? Are you comfortable with it? Well, you know, we started out, we looked at this in 2007, 2008, and um, together with the then DNI, Mike McConnell and uh, Keith Alexander, who still had it, and say we really put together the original cyber strat uh, strategy, which is very similar and has continued on, I think, is, is a good approach. And it did, by the way, definitely contemplate the use of the capabilities that NSA had, but uh, when used domestically under the authorities of DHS. And that's actually a model that, that you know, we use in other areas of the government as well. The challenge here has been it's a really technically complicated area in some respects. Um, and it's also one in which increasingly I have found uh, particularly now that I'm seeing it uh, working on the private sector side, that uh, people often talk past each other. Uh, there are people at the very high end of the threat that are very focused on, ver on very sophisticated tools and intelligence, and that is uh, important. Maybe it's the most important thing. But 80% of the problem actually is not quite as technologically driven and not quite as sophisticated. And there's some measures we could put into effect, like, for example, the legislation that's being talked about, that would reduce the risk on that 80 percent. And that would be a big step forward. To me, the biggest obstacle is, again, to manage people's expectations. You are not going to eliminate cyber threats. What you can do is you can manage the risk, and you can reduce the risk. And of course, depending on whether you're dealing with critical infrastructure, uh, you may take a more mandatory attitude than if you're dealing with kind of routine consumer behavior. Um, so I think we've, got, we've got started to move along. I'm, I think what we've seen so far is good. What's important is to make sure we don't spend too much time getting ourselves to where we have to get, because meanwhile, the problem is exacerbated really on a daily basis. We have uh, Secretary Napolitano with us only 10 more minutes. And because this is a distinguished audience, uh, people uh, with questions more interesting than mine, I'm going to turn to the audience uh, and uh, recognize a few questions for Secretary Napolitano. I think we're going to con continue on until 1.30, so for the moment we'll just focus on, on Secretary Napolitano and then come back to our other panelists. Yes, please. Yes. 
Yeah, please introduce yourself and keep the question brief. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Ted Alden from the sorry, Loud Microphone Council on Foreign Relations. Um, Secretary Chertoff, uh, four or five years ago now, you and Secretary Rice put out the concept of secure borders, open doors. Right. And thanks to all of you on the panel, there's been a lot of progress on secure borders. I would say less so on open doors, you know, global entries, positives, and some other positive initiatives. But if you look, for instance, at the visa system, it continues to be a mess. You talk to our Commerce Department about the trouble that uh, people want to invest in the United States have in getting here to this country. It's costing us jobs. I wanted to ask about the possibilities for progress there. Uh, you've announced this week this uh, the, the vetting of uh, visa overstays. You've got a system now in place to calculate visa overstays. Are you going to go to the Congress and say, look, this meets the standard. We should be able to expand the number of visa waiver countries, bring more countries in under visa waiver. Then they're part of the ESTA system, which in a lot of ways from security perspective works better than the visa system anyway. I want to get a sense of whether we're now where we need to be in security so we could start thinking a bit more about easing travel into this country because it's been a huge issue for a decade and the economic costs of it are very high. Uh, so, do you want to go first? No, you, 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 you've got go 10 ahead. minutes. Uh, I'm going to let you do uh, that. Uh, I'll come back <laughs> afterwards. Thank, thank you, Mike. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I, you know, I think the visa, the, the visa waiver issue is, uh, is a... It, it, um, uh, we have to be very careful here, um, and we have to make sure that uh, for countries that have visa waiver that they meet certain of our security uh, requirements because, uh, you know, that is, that is one of the protections that we have, but it's also uh, something that facilitates entry into the country, as, as you say. So I think we still have to view that country by country, and we need to look at the criteria and making sure that we're using the right criteria uh, for that. Uh, in addition, uh, when you talk about open windows or open uh, whatever, we have, you know, we have to focus on our ports themselves. Uh, our land ports, for example, are key avenues of trade. You know, Mexico is the number one or two trading partner of, I think, 22 states. Uh, Canada is our leading trading partner. I mean, the, the crossing at Detroit is the busiest trade crossing perhaps in the world. Uh, and uh, our ports are, are not... Uh, uh, as uh, modern as they need to be to facilitate that travel. So as the Congress looks for things to invest in that will create jobs, uh, not only now but in the future, uh, really improving the technology, the size, and the modernity of our land ports uh, would, make a, would make a real difference. Uh, this gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, for Secretary Napolitano, um, Lynn Matthijs from the National Economic Security Grid. Uh, you know, we had 9-11, which was a defining event that crystallized our response from a war on terror. Um, and yet when we look at the cyber environment, um, we're, you know, dying a death of a thousand losses of terabytes at a time. Uh, and we don't see any kind of crystallized approach by the government when, you know, with NCIX tells us there's 140 countries actively and aggressively stealing technology from us. How do we keep this country technologically advanced if all of our next level of generation of technology is being stolen before we're able to deploy it as new products? Well, um, I, I think we've discussed how we need to organize to do that. Now I think what we need to add to this is a sense of urgency. Uh, and that's what your question really goes to is, is look, uh, uh, this is happening, it's happening all the time, uh, and uh, the country needs a sense of urgency about it. Uh, we certainly have a sense of urgency about it at DHS. Uh, I think it's one of our top concerns is building out our cyber capability on the civilian side uh, and, and doing it as rapidly as possible. And we're going to have to use some unusual and creative techniques in, with which to do it. The normal government hiring processes don't work for us uh, in this space. OPM has given us authority uh, to do direct hire uh, for a thousand cyber professionals. Why? Because we have a sense of urgency about this and we need to have a sense of urgency about this. Gates and I negotiated an MOU about how to use the NSA. Uh, why did we go that route? Because the legislation was going to take longer and we needed to work that out immediately so we could have access to some of the NSA's technological capabilities. So, you know, we have the basic structure, we have the framework, uh, and that was not easy to work out. It is now, but we need the sense of urgency with which to build it out. 
So because the time is ticking inexorably on, I'm going to collect three questions uh, for, for the Secretary uh, and then let you choose among them. Um, first, this gentleman here, um, and then, That's goodness, a great I think you had your hand up. <laughs> I wish I could do that at um, <laughs> Sir, all the way back. Uh, Jan Alexander, Potomac Institute. Uh, you referred to the role of the civic society in terms of preventing terrorism. What uh, strategy uh, your department, the government in general, are developing in order to mobilize the civic society, the educational system, the clergy, the media, and so on, in order to deal with the issue of radicalization? Um, and you, sir. Hi, David Silverberg with Homeland Security Today magazine. Uh, we're on the eve of some gigantic government budget cuts. Are there any capabilities in particular that you're worried about losing or vulnerabilities that will open up as a result of these cuts, even though we don't know specifically what they are yet? And all the way back. Yes. Thank you. Peter Coharris. I lead an international law consulting firm. Um, the Bush administration had the concept of expanding the defensive perimeter, and we will expanding the defensive perimeter. And I'm wondering, how do you conceive of the department's role, not state, gov, CIA, but the department's role in forward deployment, given what we talked about in Mexico, given the developments in MENA, given that Afghanistan and Pakistan, the list goes on, will remain relevant. What is the department's notion of how to forward deploy? Let me answer uh, these in, in, in uh, reverse uh, order. Um, one of the things that has grown in the department is international engagement. Um, we now are in 73 countries. Uh, we've negotiated lots of agreements. Why to move our borders outward, um, push them outward uh, on the theory that if we wait till things get to our physical borders, um, it, that's, uh, you know, that may be too late. Uh, and so uh, we have now with Canada the Beyond the Borders strategy, which for the first time creates a perimeter view uh, with respect to uh, North America. I was with Theresa May, the Home Secretary of the UK, this morning on, on things that we are doing in conjunction uh, with the UK uh, and other countries uh, in Western Europe. So we really do have a very international view about what homeland security looks like. With respect to the budget, the fight we're in now is to get money for the disaster relief fund. We do not have enough money, given the number of disasters we've had this year, to finish the fiscal year and to do all the things we have to do. And I had to have a meeting with my FEMA director about things we will have to stop in places around the United States unless Congress signals that they're ready to put a supplemental into the DERF, the disaster relief fund. And with respect uh, to your question, how do we mobilize civil uh, society in the right way and the media in the right way? I mean, I, I think one of the roles that a secretary has is to help educate the public, uh, to talk in, in real terms about what this means for them and for their lives and what they can do. Uh, that's, that's why, sir, we changed away from using a color code because it didn't give the public information upon which to act and instead moved to an advisory system that would give them information not only about what a particular threat was, but what they could do to help protect themselves. So I, I think that's one of the things you can do from the bully pulpit of, the, of a secretary. Madam Secretary, I, I want to, before letting you go, just ask you, so what are you going to have to cut? I mean, if you're down to crunch time and, you know, you're saying unless we get the supplemental, we're going to have to cut some. Can you give us some ideas of what that might mean? Yeah, it means uh, existing joint field offices in disaster areas around the country where we're doing recovery. Uh, it, it means uh, 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 public, uh, uh, public assistance for things like building, rebuilding fire stations and schools. Uh, uh, that uh, were destroyed in the tornadoes in the spring and the flooding in the spring and, and what we've seen recently. Uh, it may even mean going back as far as uh, some of the investments that we need to repair Katrina. Um, we're going to continue with questions for the other uh, panelists, but please join me in thanking the Secretary of Homeland Security for being with us. Thank you so much. We were hoping to catch all the conversation in your car. <laughs>
Yeah. He wanted you to because take you've it to been the Oval so, Office. So forthcoming, we thought we'd just continue that for a while longer. Uh, David, I think John Pistol should come up here. John. <laughs> well, I, yes. The, John, this is by. Got the well, I, you know, there's, there's a popular acclamation. Are you sure you don't want to. Uh, <laughs> So um, let me, before I turn back the audience, let me just ask um, uh, Jane and, and, and Mike if they have any comments of their own on the, the, the questions that were just put to Secretary Napolitano. Well, I just want to comment on the visa waiver program because that's something that Congress has focused on, and it's something that has a very good purpose. It also seems to me still is something that can be exploited. And as uh, Secretary Napolitano said, it, only, it matters how it's administered, and that's right. But um, if you think about uh, people traveling freely in the EU and getting to Britain and then using the visa waiver program to come here, you can think about some bad people getting into the system. I'm not trying to talk about other European countries, but there's a lot of migration from Northern Africa, which has a lot of uh, unfortunate uh, training of uh, terror candidates who, who are able to travel to Europe and then could exploit the program. So uh, I, I would just put that on the watch list of things that we, we still need to work on. We do want people coming to our country. We do not want to send up a uh, you're not welcome sign by cutting back as we have on student visas, another place that can be easily exploited. Uh, we have eliminated potential ambassadors for this country to parts of the world where kids are trying to decide whether they're going to be responsible citizens or uh, strap on suicide vests. So, I mean, these programs have great value. They also can be penetrated. Mike. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, the, I, look, we expanded the visa waiver program, but we put into effect the uh, ESTA, which is the electronic system for travel authorization. And we did it for everybody, including, frankly, those coming from Britain and France and the traditional visa waiver countries precisely because of what Jane said, that we were concerned that, while, you know, the issue 30 years ago, it was all about people coming in illegally to overstay to work. Now the prior priority concern is people coming in to do damage. And so collecting more information, uh, even about the traditional visa waiver countries where they have problems with homegrown terrorism, actually makes a lot of sense. So um, I want to go, go back to the audience for, for further questions. And I also want to invite uh, other members yeah, of the group idea. who have comments, um, I, I don't want to ask everybody in turn to make a, but if there's something that you uh, would like to say, I want to just signal me and, and we'll be sure to recognize you before we conclude. Uh, yes, uh, that gentleman there and then you, sir. Thank you. John Doyle, independent journalist uh, blogging at uh, 4G War. Uh, to circle back to the uh, homegrown terrorist uh, lone wolf uh, threat, I'm struck by how many of the attacks uh, in recent years, Mumbai, uh, Oslo, uh, Fort Hood, have been low-tech in the sense that they've only involved small arms or, or small bombs. I realize a car bomb is not small, but it's, it's not a weapon of mass destruction. It's not CBRNE. How can we defend against that, uh, especially given the fact that so many of the ingredients are already in this country in large numbers? and the Second Amendment isn't going anywhere any, anytime soon. Um, does this require, you know, more checkpoints in public places, uh, a change in public attitude about attacks like they have in Israel and Britain, or something else? Question. Jane? Well, keep in mind Mike Leiter's comment about lone puppies. Uh, a lot of these folks, fortunately, are underskilled uh, and immature in terms of their ability to do anything. Uh, but. If, if we turn our own country into a police state, uh, then we have lost what we're fighting to, uh, to uh, protect. So that's a bad answer. But there are strategies that work. We're, we've all talked about managing risk. There's no 100% security. It is possible right this minute, notwithstanding how capable everyone sitting here is, for somebody to do something bad and harm people in this country. Uh, most likely by conventional means. There is a risk of bioterror. There's also a risk of dirty bombs because there are materials, which I don't want to identify so that some folks get bad ideas, uh, freely available in this country right now that could be used to build these dirty bombs, which would contaminate perhaps a kilometer or two of a city. That's a very bad thing and kill a few people, but it's, you know, it's not the, the, the big 
uh, nuclear weapon, which I think is highly unlikely uh, to, to, to occur here. So uh, I think, the, again, our layered strategies are working well against these threats and an informed public um, empowered citizens, um, stay tuned, more from this group, uh, is a great antidote because if, if you, you're more likely to notice something weird or wrong in your community than anyone else will. And if people know what to look for and what to do and the reporting systems are appropriate and civil liberties are protected in those systems and there, uh, there's a way to measure results, um, this is how we will minimize the risk of, of uh, lone uh, puppies or wolves. Let me, um, since Michael Leiter is here um, and has just been quoted, is a member of the <laughs> Many times. Aspen uh, Always. Homeland Security uh, Group and is just weeks uh, out of his former position as head of the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, Mike, maybe you could speak to, to this issue or others that have come up. Um, I think this, this is enough for now. Um, I, I do want to clarify uh, Jane's reference to my lone puppy, um, which is thankfully over the past 10 years, as a general matter, um, they have been lone puppies or lone dogs. And I think that's important to note for two reasons. One, they haven't been terribly competent. But as Mike Chertoff noted, they don't have to be terribly competent to do some real damage. And the second piece of this is we have to be careful about calling them lone wolves because it sort of elevates them in a way that they mm -hmm. want to be viewed as these um, vicious warriors of jihad, and I think that's negative. But the third important point about this is we can't count on them continuing their incompetence for the next 10 years, which was the heart of the discussion at the Wilson Center, that their competence is increasing. Their ability to evade some of the things that we've put in place is increasing because they're learning from experience and from leaks and the like. So we have to be very careful not to assume that we'll be safe because they will remain incompetent. The only piece I would add specific to the question is you really do need a layered approach on this. And we need to be very clear about the risk we are accepting, whether or not it's the right risk, I'm not really here to say, but we have to be clear about the risk we're accepting when we have significant limitations on the type of screening we can do for firearms purchases and the way that information is or is not shared with the full counterterrorism community. Mm -hmm. um, that is a, a level of protection we now have for Second Amendment rights that does not make our counterterrorism mission easier. It may be the political balance we choose to strike, but it is accepting some risk on the counterterrorism front. Um, and I think we have to be clear that we can layer other things on top of that, but the access to guns in the United States makes it more likely that not just terrorists, but anyone could use guns either through a legal purchase or an illegal purchase to kill other people in the name of Allah or in the name of Al Qaeda or in the name of a thousand other causes. While we're uh, turning to the wider membership of the group, I just want to ask Bill Bratton uh, if he has anything that he'd like to say uh, about the, the series of questions that have come up. In particular, we all have been watching events in Britain and in other capitals where there's a level of violent protest among youth in the streets that, uh, you know, it all, almost as if, as if the Arab Spring is jumping from Tahrir Square to, to Brixton. What, and we wonder what's going on. And I, if you have any thoughts you wanted to share with us on that, I, I know we'd be interested. A uh, belief in a philosophy out of a crisis uh, sees opportunity. I think the most recent British experience uh, is really a, a great opportunity for them one year before the Olympics to have had a preview of what might have been and might not have been anticipated in some respects. The idea of a, uh, a gang issue that quickly morphed into a very significant societal issue in terms of the sheer numbers of people who took part in the, uh, uh, the riots, if you will and the uh, police uh, delay in responding and understanding the scope of what was going on. So that lessons learned and being learned and being addressed in Britain right now will have uh, universal impact around the country. We're experiencing the flash mob uh, phenomenon here in Philadelphia and other cities. And so the increasing uh, social networking and cyber issues that have been discussed are really ones that uh, uh, we are still on that learning curve in addressing and um, the idea of 
declining resources. The Brits are talking about reducing their police by 20 percent. We're certainly embroiled in budget reduction discussions here. Uh, it's going to be very interesting over these next year or two, three years, watching the tension between budget and societal pressures and certainly the area of terrorism. Thank you. Uh, sir? The, the gentleman with his hand raised. Yes, I recognize him. Thanks. I'm Erwin Redliner, uh, director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University. I, I wanted to just uh, bridge to a slightly different topic, which, which involves lone wolves, but I, I have always been struck by the fact that Al-Qaeda and other terror organizations seem to have uh, their share of physicians in leadership positions. And I'm, I'm making this point because the issue of the lone wolf uh, being somebody quite educated as opposed to just, you know, a puppy, um, and developing the tools and mechanisms for a, a bioterror a situation for us is extraordinarily important. And I, and I think uh, the movie Contagion notwithstanding, I, I think the capacity for inflicting an extraordinary amount of uh, harm through a uh, very, very small number of individuals developing some very potent and lethal uh, microbes is out there. And one of the things that's been of concern over the last few years has been, uh, let's say, some challenges on the coordination between elements within DHS and HHS, uh, both of whom need to be absolutely arm in arm in, in trying to understand and prepare for uh, uh, pandemic on the natural side, but bioterrorism on the on the uh, side that we're Good. talking about today. So, Mike, do you want to yeah, lead let off? Me, let that? me speak to this. First of all, I, I have observed this too. Um, when people talk about who gets radicalized, and you know they have the image in their mind of a disaffected teenager, I'm always struck by the number of physicians who, by no stretch of the imagination, are disadvantaged or impoverished members of society, um, and and it's troubling to understand what makes them. Uh, become radicalized. Second, we know that Al-Qaeda and similar groups have in the past, the 9-11 Commission report talks about this, experimented to try to develop chemical and biological weapons, and uh, I have no reason to believe they're going to abandon that. Uh, the third issue is a, is a troubling issue to me. Um, I think that in, in the area of bioterrorism, it's extremely unlikely you will be able to prevent a bioterrorist attack if somebody knows how to make a weapon. Uh, many of the ingredients exist in nature. You don't have to import them. They're here in the U.S. If you know how to weaponize it, it's pretty easy to distribute. The good news is we have countermeasures for most of this. The bad news is it's hard to get them out there. And the challenge has been how do you, and we ran exercises on this, how do you deploy countermeasures like Cipro rapidly over a large population? And uh, we had the idea at one point a few years back, and when I say we, I include the president. Um, of distributing medical kits with countermeasures in advance or making them available in advance, uh, perhaps to every single family, at a minimum to schoolhouses and fire stations all around the country. And the obstacle we ran into was the FDA, which took the position that these are prescription medic medicines and you cannot distribute them unless a person has been seen by a doctor and gotten a prescription. A wonderful rule in the normal course, <laughs> completely useless if there's an anthrax attack. And um, I think somewhat to the president's surprise, he found that he couldn't simply order the program to go forward because the FDA had a legal authority to block it. To me, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I come across as being a little critical, a challenge in the public health community is uh, a tendency not to look, to, to be very focused on the kind of near-term, day-to-day challenges of flu or whatever's going around, which are important, and a, a disinclination to invest or change the model to prepare for a possible catastrophic yeah. attack, which would require investment of money, time, planning, and exercising. And if you asked me what is the single greatest gap in terms of a foreseeable medium to near term weapon of mass destruction, it is in this ability not to make the countermeasures, we have them, but to build a plan and exercise it and to have people in place who are ready to execute on responding to a major bio attack. And just to pile on a little bit, the absence of a national interoperable emergency communications <laughs> network <laughs> makes this um, geometrically uh, more horrible because uh, HHS, last time I looked, has a command center which is tied into most hospital facilities in the country and they can 
uh, find early, one hopes, if, if, if um, um, symptoms present themselves, what's going on. But then where does that information go and how do they get it out to everyone who needs it? It's impossible right now. Um, and, you know, some communities are, are, are organized, uh, certainly major regions are organized, but they're not, they can't talk to each other. And if, if I could put on the top of my list what we need to do, that's the thing we need to do. I want to turn to another member of the panel, Jim Loy. Uh, this was uh, thinking, along, thinking along sort of almost philosophical lines here, and we're talking about a 10-year window since this all began with us uh, uh, in, in 01. Uh, and the notion of the leadership associated with making these things happen that we've all been talking about. Uh, and Michael, I'll offer that, uh, you know, I, I suggested to Secretary Ridge in the early days that whether he was so named or not, he was really sort of the new secretary of collaboration among secretarial cabinet level members. Uh, and leadership is an interesting notion when you're challenged to do the kind of things that we're talking about futuristically, as you guys have been talking about today. So there's this spectrum between complacency on one end of the agenda and really focused perseverance on the other side. And Jane, either from your oversight responsibilities or Michael, from your time in the chair, how do we hold on to the focus necessary over time so that our leaders and this next generation of leaders are bred in this notion of collaborative leadership on one hand and focused perseverance on the other? Well, um, I, I, you know, I think, Jim, you're, you're uh, right on. I mean, this is a, it's a very difficult challenge. You know, I found, a, uh, I'll take an example of the 9-11 Commission. One of the uh, paramount recommendations was to build a better security system for crossing the land border by requiring either passports or a document that was equivalent in, in security to a passport. And uh, nobody had a, an argument against this as a matter of principle. It makes perfect sense. And um, so Congress passed the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, which was designed to elevate that for the land border. And then it, what typically happens is time goes by. Uh, most people focus on other things. I had the responsibility of implementing. And I discovered there were a, a small number of members of Congress who had constituencies along the northern border and an equal number of, of Canadian um, officials who hated this idea because their thought was it would deter impulse travel across the border for people who wanted suddenly, on the spur of the moment, go to a restaurant or, or a sporting event, and they don't have a passport or, or a secure document. And so they waged a very strong campaign, including putting things in the appropriations bills to delay or try to prevent us from carrying it out. And what we really had to do was we had to kind of grit our teeth, make it a high priority, and decide we were going to get this thing done. And we did. And it, it was kind of mostly done by the time I left. And then um, Secretary Napolitano took it over the, the touchdown line uh, early in 2009. Cleverly, one of the appropriations riders had actually said we had to delay implementation until 2009. They were probably hoping the next secretary would be less enthusiastic. Surprise, she was equally dedicated. But it, that's what it comes down to. You really have to, it, because the forces of inertia um, they may be small in number, but they are determined. And if you lose your focus, all this stuff winds up petering out. But I and think the question good. has, uh, and it's a very good, uh, I'm guessing, final question, uh, even, a, even a bigger message. Uh, trying to stay vigilant uh, and keep, keep the public in this game um, while actually succeeding in avoiding big threats is tricky. Um, I think to some extent we're punished for our success. The success last weekend probably means a bunch of folks will tune out now and the next time they hear there's a threat say, well, no, there isn't because there wasn't last weekend. Maybe there was last weekend. I believe there probably was and we deterred it and we, the collective we. So um, leadership is necessary. Um, there's a reason why uh, the Department of Homeland Security was created, even if it was a very ambitious concept. And it is uh, certainly, to me, one of its godmothers, uh, very uh, comforting to learn that it's evolving into an agency that, that is, is, is effective. Having uh, an intelligence community that's lashed together and can communicate horizontally and vertically is absolutely critical. Having capable law enforcement, 
uh, evolving our capabilities, being layered and unpredictable, uh, really matter because they're still out there. And if we want to manage the threat, we have to lead effectively and make the whole of government, to the extent possible, in a budget-constrained environment, work effectively. And so I, I think that this new group, which is advising the secretary and was formed uh, by Clark Kent Irvin at the Aspen Institute, yo Clark, in the back, named after Superman, by the way, um, I asked, um, uh, is, is uh, hopefully going to be very helpful. And it matters that very capable journalists like David Ignatius pay attention. So there. Well, uh, how could we not? Uh, the 9-11 the Commission has been invoked, and I, I'm going to call on a prominent member of the Commission, uh, Richard Medministi, who's also a member of the group to have the last word, and then we will adjourn. Richard. Thanks very much, David. Um, one thing that we spent a lot of time talking about in Aspen uh, was the concept of resiliency, uh, which is on all of our minds. Uh, but wasn't mentioned yet today. And that's an important part of what the Secretary uh, referred to when she talked about her bully pulpit. And one of the things which this group uh, hopefully will reinforce over time, and that is the leadership role, as has been discussed, in bringing Americans together to deal with uh, what we have seen as lone wolves, uh, uh, who have the capacity to kill Americans and to deal with it in context and with a sense of proportionality so that we do not empower, so that we do not enable those who would do us harm by overstating their capability, but in fact dealing uh, with the American sense of resiliency that's got us pretty far in the world up to this point, and re-emphasizing what we need to do as a country to continue that resiliency. And this is an area where the Department of Homeland Security can uh, take measurable leadership. I think that's a perfect uh, last word. I just would note uh, this is the launch, the public launch of something new. Uh, and if the quality of the interaction and discussion, the frankness, with which a, a current uh, a cabinet secretary, a former cabinet secretary, all of the others who contributed is any indication this is going to be uh, a, a terrific group. Uh, I'd love to be able to sit in, but unfortunately I can't because it's mostly going to be closed. But we'll follow the, the activities of this group with great interest. Thank you very much to the exactly. panelists. And to the